I'm Tommaso Poggio, and uh, uh, this is a special CBMM seminar. Uh, Misha Belkin is going to speak here. Misha, technically speaking, is uh, an academic grandchild of mine <laughs> because um, Parta Nioji was a student of mine, uh, and Federico Girosi, and, uh, and uh, Misha was a student of Parta Nioji at University of Chicago, and then he went from there to um, become a professor at Ohio State. Um, Parta, uh, his advisor, was uh, um, you know, the purest and clearest mind I've known in uh, machine learning, and not only machine learning. It died of brain tumor in 2010, but fortunately we have uh, some of his students, and we have here the best of his students, I think, <laughs> to speak with us with some interesting uh, properties, very interesting properties of the pseudo-inverse from the point of view of machine learning. Um, and I think this could uh, bring about a small revolution in uh, machine learning in the next year in terms of revising some of the foundations of it so far based on generalization and VC dimension and so on. Bishan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommy. It's great to be here. I, uh, I, I actually gave um, a, a talk here two years, or just under two years ago, a little less than two years ago. And uh, I think since then we actually understand some key missing pieces. So I'm very happy to present the picture the way we see it now. Uh, I, uh, I, I mean, it's no secret that you know, neural networks are complex objects. And uh, there, are, there are two uh, opposing kind of tendencies. So in, in terms of engineering, there is a tendency to sort of make the things more complex to get extra performance from that. From a scientific point of view, of course, we would like to take them apart to actually understand how they work and what are the building blocks. And um, I think we, the question, is that what lessons can we learn from the amazing successes of deep learning? And I, I, I think one lesson that sort of I will primarily talk about today is that really, yeah, I, I think it's quite a powerful lesson, is that uh, we really need a new theoretical foundation for certain aspects of machine learning. And uh, we have to sort of revisit the assumptions that we had. Uh, well, uh, before sort of getting into what's new, we have to uh, understand what it is that we have. And um, the basic uh, premise for most theoretical analysis for machine learning has been empirical risk minimization. How does it work? You take a class of functions, H, and you choose a function from that class to minimize the loss or the risk on the training data. Now, the analysis of this are based on um, the following connection. And to, to sort of see how this connection works, we have to compare the goal of machine learning to the goal of empirical risk minimization. So the goal of machine learning, at least in the sort of usual statistical setting, I'm assuming IID here, uh, is that you would like to minimize the loss on the data which we have not seen, right? And in the statistical setting, that means that I would like to find a function which minimizes the expected loss over all the data. And this function, of course, doesn't have to belong to any class. It's just defined by this equation. Now, um, the goal of empirical risk minimization in comparison is that minimize the empirical loss over some class of functions. So to say something about the connection, we basically have to go through the following two points, and this is due to Wapnik. Um, so he said that the theory of induction is based on first, uniform law of large numbers, and second, effective methods of inference <coughs> must include capacity control. So law of large numbers, capacity control. How does it work? Well, first, 
what is the law of large numbers? The law of large numbers basically said that empirical laws for any function in a, the class H approximate expected loss of F, so loss of uh, unseen data. Now, what is capacity control? Capacity control essentially says that H must contain functions that approximate F star. If we have one and two, then it is easy to see that uh, the ERM solution approximates the true solution and we're, we're good. So that, that, that is the foundation according to uh, Wapnik. Uh, now, to sort of unroll this a little bit, let's look at the laws of large numbers. And laws of large numbers are what you may call uh, WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get bounds. And there are many bounds of this form. They are of the following uh, type. On the left, you have the expected risk. This is what you have. Uh, this is what you get. This is the risk of a, um, on the f in the future. And that is bounded by the empirical risk, which is what you see, plus some sort of model complexity term. And this C can be norm, it can be margin. There are many different variations of this, uh, the, the meaning of this C. Now, if you look at a posteriori bound, such as margin bound, this, they're still of the same type, but they can allow C to be data dependent. So C, for example, can be some sort of margin. Uh, okay, so that, that is uniform laws of large number. Now, uh, what about capacity control? So again, this is from the book of Apnik. Uh, basically, the idea is that as we increase the number of functions in the space, the capacity, the training loss goes down, right? Because I have more functions now, so I can fit data be better. The complexity goes up. So we have this kind of two opposing uh, curves. One goes down, which is empirical risk. The other is confidence. Now, the bound is the sum, and you can see it has this U shape. So we need to look for the bottom of the, bottom of the U, which is this kind of optimal solution. Now, the way this is usually represented is a slightly more heuristical version of this. Basically, the idea is that as we're increasing capacity of the space from low to high model complexity, training, uh, training risk goes down, test risk goes initially down, and then up again. The left-hand side is underfitting, the right-hand side is overfitting, and the goal is to find that the goal within this line of thinking is to find the sweet spot. And that's basically the optimal model. Now, uh, a kind of informal corollary of this is that model with zero training error is overfit to the training data and will generalize poorly. And that makes sense since the model with uh, zero training error is on the very right and it should correspond to this kind of high part of the U-shaped curve. We will call this interpolation since in mathematics this is interpolation. Uh, okay, so this is the way we kind of um, have thought about this. But, you know, recently, and well, in, in fact, not so recently, th there have been some cracks in this. And let me point out an uh, influential paper by Jean Gattel when they said they observed the following. There are a couple of points there, but this is, at least to me, seems kind of the, the key point. They notice that you can train a neural network to have 100% accuracy on training data set. And the test accuracy is still very good. So if you're overfitting, you are not overfitting significantly. Maybe there is no overfitting. I don't know how you quantify this. Now, this is very suggestive that something is going on here. On, the, on, on its own, this is not quite enough because you may still find ways where bounds can explain something like that. But the next experiment, I think, kind of um, erases that possibility. And uh, let me point out this curve. Um, this is a little more complex. Um, this is from our paper with uh, my students, uh, C.U. and mine, Sue McMandel. Uh, we do the following experiment. We run the mice 
uh, some percentage, so this is a MNIST, it's a 10 class problem. And what we do, we randomize a 10% of the training set and 10% of the test set. It's matched. And then we can randomize 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on. And of course, you know, if we randomize, generally performance gets worse. So now, uh, let's just concentrate on the Laplace kernel. Uh, neural networks and other things are similar, uh, slightly worse. Now, what is happening here? So first, notice that uh, at 90% you have random. So if it's above 90%, it's a random guess. Now, what is the green line? The green line is the optimal. So if you randomized 50% of your data, no classifier can possibly give you much better than, uh, it's about, I think the best is about 45%, because uh, accidentally, sometimes you guess correctly. But that's, uh, so the green line is the smallest loss you can possibly have with any method. Now, what is the red line? The red line is Laplace kernel, and I don't necessarily want to define what that is exactly, but it is basically a training method, and the important thing here is that it is trained to have numerically zero loss. So by numerically zero, I mean it's like 10 to the minus 26. So it's as close to interpolation as you can get within sort of reasonable compute architecture. Now you can see that even though this is like by sort of classical standards would be extremely overfit, but we're paying no penalty. So interpolation doesn't overfit even on very noisy data with something like 70%. This is not much worse than the <coughs> best possible. And this has a serious problem for bounds. And moreover, <coughs> this is uh, as you will see, it's kind of hard to see how bound can explain this. And le let me point out what is going on here, wh why this is difficult to see, uh, why this is difficult to explain from the bound's point of view. Well, if we have a bound, the training loss of that bound has to be zero. The test loss cannot be zero because there is a large element of randomization there. Now, that means that this capacity term must completely control the test loss. And let's see what this implies for that case. And if you actually look at, um, say, a reasonably high level, like 80% or 70%, you will see that my bound has to bound this red line, right? The red line is between 70% and 90% here. Now, if it's more than 90%, the bound is trivial because I can just say it's random. Right? So more than 90% is useless. Smaller than 70% is wrong because we know that 70% is as good as I can possibly get. So that means that if I want to have a bound which explains what we're seeing empirically, it has to be between 0.7 and 0.9. And you know, if sort of if it's a usual bound, we would like to keep this as n goes to infinity. Now, there are two issues here. And the first issue is that the constant in this, I, I put this O star. So O star typically has like maybe log factors, other things. You cannot have any log factors. You cannot even have a constant which is off by 2 here, because if you, you know, if it's between 0.7 and 0.9, if you multiply by 2, you're not. That's it. So it has to be exact, the constant, to explain this. And there are really no bounds like that. But perhaps you can say, well, even though there are no bounds, maybe we can come up with some bound. Maybe just our analysis is <coughs> not tight enough. And the problem here, I think, is conceptual, is that somehow this 0.7 is a base risk. That's the risk of the optimal classifier. So somehow, magically, this quantity C of n, which is some notion of complexity, like the norm, must know about the base risk. And it must be independent of how exactly that base risk is generated. Like, you know, you can concentrate all the errors here or there. There are many ways. And it, it, it seems like it would require some sort of magic for this to be true. And there is really no reason for mathematically that something like that should be true. And in fact, there are some reasons to think that it's impossible, like mathematically impossible. Um, so that suggests that this analysis don't apply. Now, interestingly enough, this is actually the 
best practice of deep learning is exactly interpolation. And um, this is from Ruslan's tutorial. He basically said, well, you start by making the network big enough and get zero training error. This, this is not the end. You may like, tune the parameters after this and so on. But this is already pretty, you know, pretty good, right? This is you, you, you get zero training error. It does something reasonable when you improve it. So the whole uh, practice of deep learning is essentially that. And we see that this theoretical analysis um, just don't apply. They, they give trivial results. So, well, I should point out that there has been recognition of this fact. Jan Le Kun said on mm, several occasions that uh, deep learning breaks rules of statistics. Uh, now, uh, well, it actually goes much further back. Uh, Leo Bryman has a nice note, which says, which just, uh, reflections after referring papers for NIPS. And there are several questions I'm just giving you. The first one, the first one is, why don't heavily parameterized neural network cover fit the data? And this is from 95, so uh, 24 years. Uh, and, uh, I think now we have at least some answers to this. Uh, okay. So here is, I, I, if, you know, from my point of view, here is the first <coughs> key lesson of deep learning, is that the new theory of induction cannot be based on uniform laws of large numbers with capacity control. Now, of course, well, the question is, well, where, where do we go next? If, and let me first point out where we shouldn't go. And then I'll give at least one possibility for where we can. Um, so first, this kind of capacity control ideas don't really apply for that reason. Algorithmic stability is a slightly different version of that, but it has the same reliance on WYSIWYG bound, so the same kind of criticism, the same exact argument would apply to algorithmic stability the same way. Now, regularization type analysis, for example, taking of early stopping and a number of others, they're actually of a slightly different kind. They're not really, not necessarily based on those bounds. But um, the problem is that there are not many which don't diverge. Like most of them actually diverge as the regularization parameters go to zero or as, you know, you step, um, your number of steps of gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent goes to infinity. However, there is at least one example of uh, something which is really li like what we want. And I, I don't know, look, I, I think it's extremely uh, useful to think about it. And the example is really like one nearest neighbor. Uh, there are, actually, there is a really interesting Hilbert regression scheme by DeVroy, which really is very insightful, but I uh, don't have time to discuss it. But those things, um, uh, based on oracle bounds, and this kind of what you may call oracle bounds, they point, they, they basically, the analysis that you get connect expected loss to the optimal loss directly without going through empirical loss at all. Now, um, let, let's just think about one nearest neighbor because I think that's uh, really the most suggestive. It's, uh, so you take your data, right? You choose the one nearest neighbor and you assign that label. And it's really simple. And the nice thing is that there is this classical analysis by Cover and Hart, which says that, yeah, you, you have a bound, and it's at most twice the base risk. It's not great, but it's OK. And the nice thing is that analysis is not based on this type of bounds, and we directly estimate the expected loss. And the question is, well, can we do better than one nearest neighbor? And the answer is yes, and indeed we can. And um, he, here is a scheme which actually uh, probably better than one nearest neighbor. And uh, I in fact, it has some uh, statistical optimality guarantees. And the scheme is very, sim uh, is very simple. It's uh, actually closely related to something called Shepard's interpolation. You basically take the weights which are inverse distance weights, so they're singular, they go to infinity as you approach. And you do, which if you look at this, this is kind of classical uh, smoothing, uh, 
But instead of doing like Gaussian or some other smooth kernel like what we usually do, we use the singular kernel. Now you can see that this scheme is interpolating, it's easy to see. And remarkably, even though it inter interpolates, you can actually prove, and um, this is joint work with uh, Daniel Su and Partemitra, and also with uh, Sasha Racklin and Sasha Tsibakov, uh, that these schemes are, I'm hiding some of the conditions on alpha and so on, but these schemes are actually optimal statistically. So they're consistent and they're optimal, and this is in fact true in one dimension. And here is an example of that. If you look, uh, so the true model here is linear plus noise, and you can see that the red line, which is what you get with the scheme, is quite far from the optimal model at every data point. Right? At every data point, it's, it's, not, it's not close to the blue line at all. But if you actually take a point at random from this interval, you will end up very close. And in fact, the more data you get, the closer you get to the thing. And remarkably, perhaps, this is gets better in high dimension. There is some sort of blessing of dimensionality. It's somehow easier to do this in high dimension. So maybe in one dimension, if you just look at it, you think, OK, this is terrible. But it's not so bad. And in high dimension. Uh, somehow the peaks become more localized. Now, uh, a kind of a simple uh, corollary of this is this adversarial examples. Um, and basically what are adversarial examples? You take an image and you, know, you have some neural net and it uh, classifies as correctly as a dog. You add some invisible noise specially selected and now this is an ostrich. Well, uh, it's a strange, but in fact, with this kind of analysis, it's pretty obvious that if you have any label noise, you will expect to see the set of adversarial example, by that I mean just misclassified points, which are everywhere dense. I'm not saying that this is really the mechanism by which these mech this adversarial examples are formed in real life, but they do follow directly from the analysis, assuming label noise. Yeah? Why do you think they dance? Um, just like rationals are dense and reals, that kind of dance. Yeah, so around every point you have uh, unlimited number of examples. Uh, OK. So now let me sort of, so, so this talk so far, I showed empirical effectiveness of interpolation, at least on some examples, and uh, argued that theory of interpolation cannot be based on uniform bounds. And C, that there are some other methods, like nearest neighbor methods, which are uh, statistically valid, optimal. Now, uh, you can say, well, here is actually a disconnect, right? And what's the disconnect is that this nearest neighbor method is not really something that we use in practice. They're quite different type of algorithm. And well, how does it connect to things that we actually like use and care about? You know, kernel machines, neural networks, that type of thing. Uh, and I think there are two key questions here. First, what is the dependence of generalization on model complexity? And what is the role of optimization, right? Where does optimization come in? I think we have par so, so we do have partial answers to this. It's not the story is not complete, and there is uh, a lot to understand. But at least we, we sort of at least now we understand the connection. And I, I think the key observation is the following: If you look at the classical risk curve, you see this U shape. And where does this curve end? This curve ends at a point when the loss is zero, the empirical loss is zero. Now, why does it end at that point? Well, once you sort of think about this complex models like neural nets, you realize that there is nothing connecting complexity of the model to the loss. So the complexity of the model can be chosen arbitrarily. This is actually even true for linear regression, but it's kind of an alien way of thinking about this. But for neural nets, it's pretty clear, right? You just add some neurons. So you can continue this indefinitely, and you can continue to grow the model. And 
if you continue growing the model, you realize that you have this uh, second regime of the model when the test risk goes down again. We, we call this double descent because that's kind of the second stage. Of the, the, there is a classical descent, the first part of the U, and this is the second <laughs> descent. And the interesting thing here is that every model on the right of this curve is interpolating. So they all have zero loss, but yet somehow getting more complex models improves performance. Now, uh, we, have, we have done a bunch of experiments on various uh, fully connected neural networks, uh, random forest, L2 boost, um, various uh, artificial data and real data. This is a rather robust kind of phenomenon. It's you, you, can, you can observe it very consistently. Now, um, I should also point out that uh, other people also observe this curve. Um, but the key is, well, the, the question is like why? why? Why are we observing this? And what is the mechanism underlying the second descent? And I think this picture actually explains. I, I think that's like a lot of intuition just in this picture. So w <laughs> let, let me describe what this is. The blue line here is I'm using 40 ReLU features. So I'm taking ReLUs, and I'm generating a two-layer neural network. The first layer is ReLUs, but I'm choosing the coefficients at random. So I'm not training those coefficients. I'm just using it as a feature map. And as you can see, 40 features, ReLU features is enough because it's a 40-dimensional kind of parameter space. It's enough to fit the data exactly. Now, the black line is 4,000 ReLU features. And you can see that um, there are a couple of observations here. First, I think it is visually obvious that the blue line is much worse than the black line. Now, whether, like, how do you want to say what is worse, what is better? OK, it's a somewhat philosophical question. But it is uh, clearly, you know, like, uh, I think nobody would choose the blue line over the red one. And another thing to notice is that when you go to 4,000 ReLU features, this is still a piecewise linear function. But with 4,000 ReLU features, you cannot actually visually observe that it is linear. You can, it's, it's, it's smooth. It's essentially smooth. So you're converging to something which is smooth and presumably better than what you have when you have fewer features. And in fact, if I, you know, if I draw this with like 4 billion features, it would look exactly the same. You wouldn't be able to see the difference. So you can see at least that having more features doesn't actually um, hurt you. Now, uh, l l let me maybe describe this mechanism in a little bit more sort of granularity. So let's consider random uh, Fourier features, which were proposed by Rahimi and Rekt in 2007. And w what are random Fourier features? It's very similar to this random ReLU features, but you just take sines and cosines with random coefficients. Uh, or, or complex exponential, it doesn't really matter. And it's a, so it's a neural network with one hidden layer and cosine on linearity. Now we take the hidden layer of size n, capital N, and data size n. And the key property of this, which was observed in their paper, is that as capital N goes to infinity, yeah, I'm increasing the number of features, this actually converges to a kernel machine. And kernel machine is some sort of functional minimum norm solution. So if you look at this, you see what is happening. And this is uh, this actually on Timit, which is a real data set. Oh, yeah, you, you may say, well, 50% error rate, it's pretty bad. But it's like a 30-something class. It's, it's way above the baseline. Uh, actually, the state of that would be about 30%. This is not bad at all. Uh, so, when, uh, so what is happening here is that this is 10,000 data points. And you can see that I have this U. This U store, uh, the peaks at 10,000 data points, which is exactly when you get zero loss. And then as I'm increasing the number of features, this are thousands, I converge. 
to this red line, or at least visually converge to this red line. And this line is exactly the kernel machine, which I can compute differently by using kernel, the kernel itself, with Gaussian kernel. And uh, so why now am I getting better performance here? And the way to understand this is really to look at the picture of the norm. So what is happening is I'm first increasing the number of features. My norm initially increases. And then after this point, it actually starts to decrease. Why? Because I have now many solutions which all have zero loss, right? We have this huge space of solutions with zero loss. And by choosing the minimum norm, it allows me to choose one which is best. So the more features I have, the smaller norm solution I have. It kind of works the other way around from the class. So in the classical regime, of course, when I have more features, I have larger norm. In this regime, when I have more features, I have smaller norm. It's the opposite. And as you see, actually, you, you, it works quite nicely. You really see that it converges to this kernel machine norm, which, again, I can compute explicitly. Uh, so more features basically is better approximation to minimum norm solution. Uh, let me skip this. So in, at least in the noiseless case, we can, have, we can show that infinite norm is actually kind of um, optimal. But it's, um, it's a noiseless case, so you may, maybe you think it's not super interesting. OK. But, uh, but actually, there is something interesting, because this form of this bound is very different. It's, it's obtained by approximation, and it's a very different form from the usual bounds that we have in machine learning. Um, OK. I think a kind of interesting outcome of this is that even in the linear case or even in the kernel case, this really leads to new, um, in really needs to new analysis. And even for the simplest linear cases, it's something that we can now observe that sort of um, hasn't or ha hasn't been fully observed before. I, I, I'm reluctant to say it hasn't been observed because it probably has. Um, and uh, I think there is significant evidence that deep neural networks exhibit similar properties. Again, this net is uh, the evidence for neural networks is only partial, but it's pretty consistent. Um, OK. Now, uh, so this is maybe kind of the connection. This is ERM, so classical ERM. We choose a space of function, and we try to find function which minimizes the loss. This modern sort of interpolation view is that instead of doing this, we should minimize the norm over the subspace of function which fits the uh, constraints exactly. And the interesting thing is that we never actually do this explicitly, at least not in neural networks. The minimization of the norm is hidden somehow within the um, dynamics of the stochastic gradient methods of gradient methods. So that there is something built in which do this while we are sort of pretending we are doing that. OK. Now, I should point out that the norm is sort of not the only aspect of this. And you can get something very similar by averaging. And uh, what, what, the, what the sort of picture here? So imagine I take my data, and I take a tree. And I build this tree by doing random splits. With enough random splits, I can fit my data exactly. And in fact, this is very closely related to something called PERT, which Cutler and Zhao proposed in uh, 2001. Uh, essentially, same thing. And now, um, so, but the tree that you get is actually not good. It interpolates the data, but it's not good. But if you average a bunch of those trees, you get a solution which is much better than any individual tree. So again, each tree, it has zero loss, but it's not good. It's at this borderline of the, of the, of the, thresh, uh, the interpolation threshold. When you average those things, you're getting something which is functionally much smoother, subject to the same interpolation constraint. So that is a kind of general picture. And um, maybe we can think of it as a form of Occam's razor, is that the simplicity here is measured by some functional smoothness. And you want to choose the function which is most smooth, subject to the constraint of exactly fitting the data. Now, there are three ways to increase smoothness. Um, there are explicit minimum functional norm solutions, like what we did. That's the easiest way to understand. 
they're um, implicit bias GG optimization when somehow it's hidden in the process. And there is also averaging, which seems quite different. Interestingly enough, for kernel machine, they all three coincide with the, you know, explicit is just solving the system, implicit doing uh, gradient descent or SGD, and averaging is the Bayesian view of Gaussian process. You're averaging, traje you're, you're averaging trajectories. Uh, okay, so that's, um, that is, uh, that is the, um, sort of generalization landscape. Uh, on the left, we have this classical Wieswick bounds. On the right, we have this modern regime, uh, which are based on inductive biases. And now we are starting to have first analysis, and uh, Sasha in particular uh, has recently worked out an interesting example of a kernel machine. Um, um, so, here is an interesting thing here. I think that um, and that's maybe kind of a remarkable outcome of this. If you think about overfitting, classically what we have is that uh, overfitting is somehow, when we overfit, we should reduce the number of parameters. Here, you can see that overfitting actually is a band it's a range of parameters. And now there are two ways to deal with overfitting. One way is to go left, reduce the number of parameters. The other way is actually to increase the number of parameters. So you can deal with overfitting by increasing the number of parameters. That's, you know, deep learning. <laughs> Okay, now let me make a couple of points about optimization. I think it's important. I don't have time to talk about it in detail. There is more to say about it, much more to say about it. But let me point out two important things. In the classical regime, there are many local minima, and SGD with fixed size does not converge. It oscillates. The modern regime is different. First, every local minimum is global. Well, at least for networks wide enough. There, there are some caveats, of course, to every one of the statements. But uh, Second, local methods converge to global optima. And third, um, and this is uh, joint work with CU and mine, Rev Basili, you can show that a small batch SGD converges as fast as gradient descent per iteration. And what does it mean per iteration, right? An iteration of gradient descent is an epoch. An iteration of, uh, you know, if you have one million data points, that's like one million, right? You have to go through one million. An iteration is small batch SGD, say, 100. So it's like a million versus 100. So it's an uh, overwhelming computational advantage of stochastic gradient descent. Um, so this is kind of the summary of that. And then uh, at the end, I'll give a couple of uh, points about the inductive bias. But this is uh, the summary of that part of the talk. So first, classical models, you need careful parameter selection. There are many non-global minima for optimization, at least for things like neural networks, not, of course, for linear regression. And SGD oscillates. For the modern model, you get good generalization from inductive bias. And it's really not that sensitive to the number of parameters. All minima are global. And SGD actually converges uh, fast, very efficient computationally. It's, um, it's uh, kind of a, an amazing picture. Uh, all right, so now, I mean, you, you can say, well, well, there are, there are probably a number of questions about this, but I mean, this is far from a complete picture, but but one key question here is that I said, well, generalization from inductive bias, but what is this inductive bias? Where is it coming from? And, you know, for linear regression, we actually understand it's a norm. But in general, like, what is this norm? It's some sort of functional norm. So le let me, um, maybe I'll describe a little bit. Um, what it can be. And I, I should point out that really this is kind of the key to this understanding inductive bias. It's kind of the key to understanding uh, generalization, right? Because before we had this capacity of the space, now it's all replaced by this inductive bias. 
Um, and I, I should point out there's been a lot of progress toward understanding it. And uh, for example, neural tangent kernel, this recent work by Jaco et al. Is, uh, they, they basically say that in certain regimes, we can view neural networks as implementing some kernel, and this kernel, maybe we can understand what they, I, I mean, kernels are not easy. But uh, so just because something reduces to a kernel doesn't mean that it's easy to understand, but at least it's much easier than the original neural net. Uh, and, um, but le let me describe some of um, our work with uh, Ajit Radka and Caroline Uller uh, on um, understanding inductive bias in some special cases of neural networks, with deep neural networks, when uh, I think something pretty remarkable happens. And b before I, I describe the actual result, let me uh, first point out the difference. I think it's important here. And um, I would like to differentiate memorization and interpolation. And they are sort of used interchangeably in the literature, and there is significant confusion. I think they are quite different things. So interpolation is just zero loss. So for example, this uh, curve interpolates the four data points. Now, if I remove those points, there is no way to extract the data just from the structure of this curve itself. So this curve interpolates, but it doesn't memorize. There is no way I can figure out now where those points were. So memorization needs something else. It has to have a retrieval mechanism, right? Now, um, if you have something like this, I can remove the data and I can still reconstruct the actual data from the structure. If I, if I know that these peaks correspond to my data, I can still reconstruct. So that's, um, uh, I think, the distinction. And it's important, it will be important in a second. Um, first, uh, we consider the case of uh, deep autoencoders. And what's an autoencoder? It's simply a map from RD to RD, OK? So it's just a map from a space to itself. And it's parameterized by this W, and this could be like some complicated thing, you know, from deep neural net. Now, uh, how do you train this? You train phi of W xi minus xi. So you basically train each point to map it into itself. And you use the usual gradient descent to train this for some standard architecture. You know, they take like a five layer neural net or something. Now, uh, once we train this, if it interpolates, right, if it has enough parameter, it will interpolate, meaning that phi w of xi will be equal to xi. That means that you can view this as a discrete dynamical system with fixed points xi, right, because it maps each xi to itself. Now, uh, what kind of point are this? And it turns out, and I think it's quite remarkable, if, you know, I'll, I'll explain in a second why this is would be difficult to expect this, is that thick points are actually attractors. I, this, is not, this is not always true, but this is mostly true. You, you would, I would have to give a lot of caveats to say like, when exactly this is true. But certainly there are some things. We, we, can, we can even make uh, 500 points to be attractors. Like you train with 500 points and they're all attractors. Uh, so now, how do you memorize? And apparently, at least for many of those things, there are no other attractors. So how do you memorize? You simply train the neural network to minimize this loss, the difference. And how do you retrieve? You, you start with a random input, and you iterate this thing. Now, this is what it actually looks like. This is input, and this is output after one iteration. So you see, after one iteration, you already get a one of this, this is CIFAR 10 images. So I start with noise, after one iteration I get this. Well, this is visually close to one of the images. It's not actually exactly one of the images, but if we iterate this like two or three more times, it becomes numerically exact. Um, so now, uh, why is this surprising? Um, well, I think this is a picture to explain why this is surprising, actually. And in general, imagine that I, so what's an attractor? An attractor is a picture like this. It's that you have these points, these lines of the dynamical system, and they all point inside. 
what's not an attractor? Not an attractor is a point like that, when some of these errors go in and some of them go out. Oh, they can all go out, of course. In the trajectory center like this, you can see that none of the, th these points will not actually converge unless they're exactly on these flow lines. Now, um, if you think about it, how many of these errors I have, the number of these errors is equal to the number of the dimensions. So if I am in 100 dimensions, like these images are, of course, all pretty highly dimensional. If I have 100 dimensional data, right, I have 100 of these errors. If each error is random, I mean, it's not, but just humor me. Um, if each of them is chosen at random, then it's uh, the probability that there's an attractor is 1 over 2 to the d, which is 1 over 2 to the 100. So we basically would never see an attractor if they were really random. And the fact that we see these attractors all the time, I think it's kind of a powerful uh, indication that something really interesting is happening when you train this network using gradient descent. It's, it's a strong hint about what, uh, what inductive bias of gradient descent is for this type of uh, systems. And in fact, you can even do uh, a movie, so you can, you can encode this uh, sequentially. And then instead of an attractor, you get an attractor cycle. You, know, you can, uh, let me see. This is, it starts with a noise, and very soon it uh, becomes a movie. This is just attractor cycling, right? This is, uh, each image gets encoded into the next one. And uh, I mean, maybe I'll, uh, I'll end with a speculation that maybe this could be a model for biological memory. I, it's uh, certainly tempting to say that. Uh, OK, I think I'll stop here. And I would like to acknowledge my wonderful collaborators. <laughs> <laughs>